started. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight to the session of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, to start with, I've asked Michelle to lead us in the pledge. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, our first order of business tonight will be the recording of our minutes. Has anybody had a chance to review those? I move that we approve the minutes from June. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> motion passes. Those minutes can be set. The first order of business, I guess, is there any reason to go out of order tonight, Dave or Brandon? You just want to follow the order we have? Okay. First order of business is then a minor plat amendment and zone change. This is a public hearing. Thank you. So as we can see, uh, the part of town that we're looking at, if we want to advance to the next slide, we're looking at three properties. Um, the applicants had looked to adjust some property lines and staff in reviewing it um, noticed that there were some issues as far as uh, average lot sizes with the zoning. Um, not necessarily at the fault of the applicant, um, but some uh, action and decisions made in the past as far as the property uh, developed um, on the east bench. And so what we have is a request to adjust some property lines, um, but in order to bring those lots into conformance, um, the DRC did feel it would be necessary to propose a rezone to those properties, hence the uh, request that you have before you uh, being dual in nature, both the minor plat amendment, um, which approval is contingent upon the city council taking action on the zone change. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So the area is predominantly R19, and so we'd be looking at just the three lots uh, shifting to the R18. Um, but as indicated in the staff report, there's no additional lots that are being created, um, no change in the density. It's all, all three are existing residences. Um, just looking to clean up property lines and adjust some property lines. Are those the property lines, the ones that are proposed, the ones that the property owners currently perceive to be their property lines? Is it the same? Um, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that they're they're cleaning up where they uh, feel the property lines have existed. Um, but then also in addition to that, there's an adjustment between lot two and three that's being proposed. And are the owners of lot two and three okay with this proposal? Yes. Is that us? Is that us? That's not you. Okay. Uh, That's two and three. Are, what were the purposes that, that uh, these lots were being used for that now we necessitate a change, and what is proposed for those lots now? So what, if this is if this is approved, what brought it to our attention was the request to adjust some property lines, and so in doing that, we looked and looked at the lot sizes and looked at the history of the zoning and looked at the platting of the lots um, and how that changed over the years to get to where we are today. And so what we're proposing today would clean up those past actions and solidify where the property lines are. Single family homes before, mm -hmm. single family homes now. Yep. Okay. Just bring it into conformity to what it really is. What it currently exists as, yes. Right. There's no new construction going to be happening, just, going, just no. cleaning it up. Okay. Was it approved at R19 MPD? Is that why they have lots that are non conforming with the R19? No. Um, I didn't bring the presentation, but we did go through the history with the DRC. You can see the neighboring lots to the east, um, orient north to south. At one point, these corner lots were subdivided east and west, and then it was subdivided north and south to get the additional lot. Um, and so. It's just kind of a peculiar history. Okay. Is this anything that will affect any neighbors, anybody, change anybody's way of life, anything you notice? Not that we're contemplating, no. Change anything if you were to sell your land, no. your property? Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll now open up to public hearing. If anybody has anything to come up and say about this matter, I uh, would welcome you to come up to speak to the microphone. If you come up, please, if you'd state your name. And if, like, if you're one of the property owners, uh, please tell us which lot you're, you're speaking about. Hi, my name's Jamily Banks, and I live in the odd-shaped lot, the one with the pie wedge on it. So I don't understand the difference between R1 and R9. Could you explain that to me? It's the size of the the size of your lot to have the dwelling on. So it's just changing it from uh, nine thousand to eight thousand, right? Square. So it doesn't it doesn't change anything else about zoning. It's just that they it can change un, the size it, of the lot. It is, it is a, unchanged. That is so a R1 zone. R19 allows as a permitted use, and the staff can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but as a permitted application in the R19 zone, you can have a lot that's nine thousand square feet or larger and it would be approved administratively that would be your property right within the r19 zone in the r18 zone the same is true at 8,000 square feet and above okay and so that's that we were at the smallest that we could be on those lots the way they divided them those two lots on the corners yes and that was my question a little earlier to mr schneider's I was wondering if it was approved as an R19 with an MPD, and I'm sorry if that might not make sense to you, but... Did not. Um, sorry, I don't know anything about zoning. No, it's all good. No, no, no. It's, all good. it's a good question. Uh, Joseph knows too much. <laughs> okay. And then, um, by decreasing that, does that affect the property values of the surrounding lots or not? Where we're where we are at this point, what does it do to the values of the other properties? They are, they are. That is a question I'm not going to answer is that I don't know property values and how it will affect property values definitively. I'd be happy to speculate. Thank you. I am not happy to speculate. <laughs> the county assessor is the one who would appraise the value of the properties. My assumption is where there's no change in the use, um, just the cleaning up the, of the properties, the only change should be minuscule in the sense that uh, we're not increasing or decreasing the size of the lot severely. That's my so speculation. So my understanding, we are decreasing the size of the, I guess that's lot two. Yeah, the middle one. We are yep. decreasing it. Slightly, yep. Okay. So Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would just add to that, that if there is a maybe proportionate decrease in the property value of one of the properties, there would be a proportionate increase with one of the others. I mean, we're, we're talking about the same area same taxable area and different things like that on the whole. So that's the only logic that I can maybe apply here. Yeah. But your question was specific to adjacent neighbors. They shouldn't have an impact. According to what Brandon's saying, there shouldn't be any impact because theirs is not actually changing. It'd only be the lots that are affected by the square footage of their lot. Which is negligible. Anybody else have anything to say on this matter? Okay, we'll close public hearing. Commissioners, anybody have any questions for staff or for anybody else? I have a question for staff, but I don't know if they know. Uh, was it approved as an R19 MPD? And if so, it doesn't, I don't know if we need to change the zoning. It wasn't. It wasn't, that's why. All right. Bales. If no one else has any question, I'll entertain a, a motion one way or another. I move the Planning Commission recommends approval of the zone change for the Green Acres Estate Plat F, uh, subject to compliance with staff's findings and conditions. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. So the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. That will now go before the city council, and they'll have they'll make their decision. Our next order of business is the annexation, the minor Goodwin annexation. Thank you. Uh, we do have the applicant present here tonight. Um, different type of application. This is also a recommendation to the city council. Um, you can see the highlighted area here. It abuts the railroad tracks that we share as a common border with Mapleton City. Um, 
You can see uh, this is a, of importance uh, when we reviewed it with the DRC. You can see that it's taking slightly under half of an existing unincorporated island and annexing it into the city. So it'll, it'll decrease the uh, remainder that's um, there on the east bench. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, this is the annexation plat. As you can see, there's multiple properties that are involved. Um, let's go to the next slide. Oh. Um, so what the applicant's specifically looking for is annexing 59 acres into the city. Um, we currently do have this area within our annexation policy boundary, as well as our, our growth management boundary, excuse me. Um, and based on the recommendation from the Development Review Committee, um, where there's not pending applications for development, uh, the DRC felt it was necessary to recommend the rural residential zone um, in the meantime. Hence the findings as written. Any questions for staff on this item? Are any property owners within the boundaries of the annexation, proposed annexation against being annexed into the city? No, if we go back a slide. So the applicant is uh, the miners um, who are here tonight and they own the property that's adjacent to the railroad track. He initiated the annexation petition. Um, the Goodwins, um, I don't have a pointer, but it's on the north side of the annexation along the 100 south. Um, they were added uh, thereafter and then um, Union, uh, Rocky Mountain Power owns the remainder of the properties that have been added to the petition as well. And they've all coordinated with our staff and are in favor of being part of it. Thank you. Uh, Brandon, I'm not sure if this is the right question or the right time to ask about this, but the final item on our agenda, mm -hmm. I could not tell where on the map that was. Is this part of this annexation? No, is no. It so if we go back out, go, sorry, go back a slide. So, sorry, once again, I don't have a pointer, but um, you can see where Quiet Valley is. You can see the city limit lines with Can Highway 6 that converge. So just north of that. I'll see if I can not blind anybody. Um, so here is the annexation proposal. The Johnson subdivision sits right here. Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry, I, yeah, no worries. I just couldn't find the last one. Thank you, Brandon. Any Comments or discussion points with the aid commissioners? Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to make a motion if you're ready to entertain one. I'd like to hear and see if anybody else has any questions or comments. Yes, first. sir. <laughs> okay, Joseph. I move the planning commission recommends approval of the minor goodwin annexation as, as recommended by staff, subject to staff's findings and conditions, and with the zoning designation of rural residential. Thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion is second. Let's have a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. You guys got off easy. Well, it depends on which situation you're talking about. We <laughs> need <laughs> a year. Yes. Okay. He, he's been very patient as additional properties were uh, consulted. Oh, I was referring to the teaching of her children. Oh. oh. <laughs> I can sit back down. If yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, this is a zone change for the Warner Flower Farm? Yes. And so um, I think all of these items are queued up for July 11th. I'm looking at Dave. July 11th, correct, for these items? Next Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a unique application. Uh, I don't want to go into that. too much of the history. So we do have the applicant here tonight. I appreciate uh, him being present. Um, this is a piece of property that is owned by the Catholic Church. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. It's there off of 1400 East. It um, has a home and then the majority of it is uh, vacant that's been used on and off for agricultural purposes over the years. I'm told that it's one of the uh, remainder pieces of the larger 
um, estate properties that were up on the south bench um, as this area developed. Um, the applicant has come forward and he's interested in running a wholesale nursery that would specialize in flowers. Um, I'd be more than happy to let the applicant give you more details and answer any questions you might have specific to the use. Um, but when the DRC looked at it and his request, um, it's, it's unique and I think it'll fit well in the area. There were a few things that caused concern for them. One of them was the arrangement of the lots. It used to be in three separate parcels. Um, the applicant and the church have since uh, taken the steps with the county to get those combined into one. And then the other was that it would be contingent upon a rezone to the RR, which would allow the wholesale nursery as a permitted use. Hence the request that we've got here before you tonight. And so the request would be, if we go to the next slide, um, the area is currently R19, and so just the outlined areas that are um, owned by the church and under contract to the applicant would be uh, rezoned to the RR to accommodate the proposed use. Any questions for staff at this time? I have a question for you. Um, staff's right, staff recommends approval. Um, in your estimation, is an RR zone and R19, and they play nice next to each other and coexist peacefully, and everyone gets to enjoy their property rights. I would believe so. Um, I don't have a slide prepared that shows like a side-by-side -side table of the uses that are permitted one versus the other. Um, I think based on the history of how the property's been used and the properties, the remaining properties have developed around it, I don't foresee an issue. Foresee an issue with this applicant or foresee with what it could be in the future? Um, we can definitely pull that up. Um, if you don't mind pulling up Spanish Forks website, we'll pull up the code. Um, some of the things that are listed in the RR are going to be tied to the acreage. Um, and so there's definitely some animal rights um, that would increase with a change from R19 to the RR. Um, Is RR consistent with the um, city's general plan? So the general plan, that's a great question, is actually medium density residential, which the R19 is consistent with that. But the RR is not? Uh, as far as the consistency table, I'd say no. But as far as the uses and enjoyment of the property, I'd say yes, there's some similarities. Uh, hence the existing single family residence did, on the property. Did the DRC analyze this issue in making a recommendation? This and others, okay. yeah. they. Did uh, discuss it two or three, two or three times. Uh, if we go to 15, part three, and then go to 16, and then if you'll select, it's the top one: agricultural and rural residential. So there's a list of agricultural uses that are spelled out here. Um, Obviously, number seven is the existing use that we can con continue. Um, and then the requested use that they're looking at is number six. I believe the applicant has a uh, contractual five-year lease on the property. And so in the foreseeable future, it wouldn't uh, necessarily change. But that's definitely something we can talk through if there's some uses that cause you concern. I mean, I think the use that would cause concern is animal, animal husbandry going on, livestock, if it was ever brought into that area. I mean, that would so kind of exist. Today in the R19 zone, they could bring in livestock. Do they have that, that right? It would just be tied to the size of the property. And so you need, um, the property is 2.2 acres, so you need at least a half acre um, to set aside for the home. And then the remaining half acre could increments be used. could so they already have that right. Yeah. What about that dogs barking outside or? So those uh, would be subject to uh, site plan approval um, and would take in a, into effect the layout and arrangement of the site, but that's a good, that's a good concern. I'm also concerned about 10. Is that vague? 
How tall can that grain mill be, be next to maybe someone's house? It'd be subject to the uh, height re restrictions of the RR. Which are? Uh, we can pull that up. If you go to the section 40, RO residential office, and then scroll down to the very bottom. Oh, go up. Sorry. Keep going up. A little bit further, please. All right, so RR, you can see, has height. a maximum height of 35 feet, which is uh, the same as the R19. So one thing so they could build their house to anyway. One thing that occurred to me is that uh, the use that they're proposing is wholesale flowers. I don't know how much parking will be required for equipment and trucks that would be there. Uh, would it also allow for any uh, any regular uh, well any what what's the term that we want to use? Uh, would it be open to the public to go and no, purchase? No, it will not function as a retail. Only outlet, as just okay. for wholesale. But and, it could, right? Well, not according necessary. to this, it could. Under, that was that which, was why I was wondering. It could not. Which one are you looking it at? It could Joseph? not. In the RR, it could not be a, a nursery, a retail nursery. It says no. wholesale. Okay. So trucks, trailers, big, really big orders would be paid a semi truck. <coughs> the the applicants here, right? And we yes. Can talk yes. To yeah. them. Okay. We'll do that when we. Um, you go to the R19 permitted uses. I just want to see how. So it's going to be the yeah. section below. Oh, go up. Are we number in? twenty? Oh. So single family municipal municipal facilities, excuse me, and churches. Mr. Brandon, so I'd like to hear from the applicant, if we could. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Okay. Mr. Brandon, you have a question? Good evening. Uh, I'm Reed Warner. Um, so the Warner f uh, Farm, Flower Farm, it's actually named under Fiori Violi, is the name of the business. Um, as far as some of the concerns for the wholesale, wholesale nursery is where it falls under for code. What we're doing is is just that we sell our flowers as part of a collective, and it's called Picklink. We sell um, across the Wasatch Front. So the primary markets that we have, we have a market in Midvale and we have a market in Farmington. So we transport our flowers there. <clears throat> Occasionally we'll have orders that are brought back down to Spanish Fork for local florists. They will come and pick them up there. Um, but it's meant to be a growing space and a storage space for for flowers and processing. That's it. No major trucks. We're we're too small. I don't even have. I have a tractor, <laughs> but all of our fields are so small. Our beds are three foot wide by forty feet long. So we use walk behind tractors to to work the area. So even major equipment isn't being used other than to move topsoil around, things of that nature. Will this be open fields or will this be greenhouses or? We have requested a greenhouse, and it's not really a greenhouse, it's a hoop house or a high tunnel. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, mm -hmm. a plastic covered um, structure just for weather protection. So it's not like a polycarbonate, full heated, air conditioned greenhouse, it's just a high tunnel. And that, that request is part of the initial plan. It's 30 feet wide, 80 feet long. Um, I've discussed with every surrounding neighbor that touches it um, and got their feedback and I didn't hear a single negative comment. They seem to be thrilled with the idea that a vacant lot that was full of weeds was being used and maintained. So for us, it was a great opportunity. And for the organization, the community, we feel like it's been a, a, 
a welcomed uh, engagement. So I had a number of volunteers from around the neighborhood to even come out and help and learn how to do flowers and different stuff like that. So we've been thrilled with what we've been able to do so far. So is, is this seasonal flowers? <clears throat> Obviously, I guess if you don't have greenhouses, there'll be things that can be yes. grown in the area. Yes. So the, the, the high tunnel basically allows us to just extend the season is, is all it's really for. Extend the season and protect some of the, the more tender, vulnerable flowers. What about, um, Commissioner Menahol asked a little bit about the, the traffic that'll be coming in that area with deliveries and that. What do you see that volume or what kind of- All the uh, delivery vehicles? and everything goes to my house. I live right there. Um, all the deliveries of any seeds, fertilizer, any of that stuff would go there, or I would pick it up in my personal truck or trailer and bring it in. Um, we did bring in road base and gravel to prepare some of the area. So we had high, you know, dump trucks come and bring it in, and then we used skid steers to move it around and get it all prepped. Um, this area, wow, right here is more of that parking utilization space. Um, back in the back is where we've stored our uh, topsoil, and then we just move it back and forth. Currently, this is planted in flowers. This is being prepped for next season. And that's also where the greenhouse would go. How tall is the greenhouse? It's uh, 15 feet tall. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. I, <laughs> we're thrilled about the opportunity, so. And the property will still be owned and uh, uh, by the Catholic Church. It is, I have, have a five year lease yeah, with them. They're, they're all on board. They are, I, in fact, working with the city, we were able to jump on a call discussing the parcels, the way it used to be, three separate parcels the benefit of bringing it into a single parcel and moving it to rural residential. They were curious what that would do to the value, what it would do to their future endeavors if they wanted a church or anything else on it, and felt that that would all be consistent with rural residential. And if needed, they could propose at the end of this to take it back to R19. Uh, when is, you said five years, five years from today? Five years. five years from January 23, so in 2028 is when, December 2028 is when that'll expire. To operate the nursery. It is. And the, we'll have a one year um, notification if that will be extended or rescinded because it'll take a good six months or more to move everything we off. We have built an extension option for the lease. We do. To, well, to, review, to review for another five years. Oh. And after that, I don't know, you know, let's see, I'll be. 68 at that point. I don't oh, know how much I really want to be uh, running nurseries by then. Plenty more flowers to grow. <laughs> so um, we don't anticipate Maybe much traffic. What we've done so far has been uh, one day a week for, for florists to pick up. Normally they're there for 15 to 20 minutes and they could drive away. Currently we have eight florists in the local area that are part of our collective, most of them go to Midvale, pick up their stuff when they're doing their other rounds, but several of them would like to start utilizing this for their local pickup. Thank Any you. other questions? I think that's it, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Snyder did a great job of providing, I think, the, the fundamentals on the application, that type of thing, but maybe just a little bit more background on how staff has looked at this, and I'm not trying to necessarily be persuasive at all, but we received a building permit application, I think, for the greenhouse. No, for the shed. For the shed. And that's what got us looking at the use of the property and trying to make some decisions, first of all, about how we as staff felt about the idea of a flower farm being here. Immediately, we were concerned about this being a high traffic use, thinking that this would have some type of a retail component. 
So learning that that wasn't the case was an important hurdle for us to get over as staff. Um, as was mentioned, we spent a number of weeks deliberating on how to approach it. In short, uh, after thinking about creating maybe a new zoning district that would be like an urban farming zoning district, exploring ways to change maybe the text of the R19 zone or some of the other residential zones with that zone to accommodate what we're looking at here um, and taking into account what I think might be the most impactful thing that somebody could do in the rural residential zone that you can't do now in the R19 zone, which is simply have more large animals than uh, one per every half acre, which is the current limit in the rural residential zone. That same limit doesn't apply. We do not see that necessarily as a, a likely scenario here at all. So understanding that that potential risk was simply changing the zoning. The Development Review Committee got comfortable with this recommendation with the idea still that we do expect the use of the property someday to change. So where we use the rural residential zone, as was the case with the annexation that you made a recommendation on, it's kind of a holding zone that a property can remain in until somebody has uh, some type of a proposal to permanently develop the site. We feel like that's appropriate here. Um, take this for what it's worth, but more often than not, that's when neighbors get concerned. It's when the alfalfa field or the rural residential use gets changed and somebody wants to put homes on it. That's seemingly when we hear the most uh, concern from a neighborhood. Uh, we think that potentially this could be a, a, great, uh, a great thing for the neighborhood, something neighbors will appreciate having. Obviously, that depends a lot on how it's operated. But uh, that's partly at least why we've supported the, the proposed change to the rural residential zone. Dave, a, a question that has arisen in my mind as we've talked about this, since it is an RR zone, are there conditions and uh, rules that would govern? This is a pretty small area inside of a residential area. It's about the largest piece of gra un, undeveloped ground in that area. And if it's RR, will there be uh, any kinds of protections for the surrounding neighbors for smells, uh, hours of operation? Uh, you know, I don't know that uh, since they're flowers, they need fencing and stuff, but are, those, are there those kinds of things that need to be considered if, if, this, is, if this is passed? Uh, or because RR, we're generally talking about something that's out in the county where yeah. the rest of the county is, is RR too, rather than in the middle of town. So I wonder if we, is there any kind of protections for those neighbors? I guess that's what I'm asking. If there were to be something that you and all was egregious. Perhaps in a couple of different ways. And neither of these would be fun to pursue. First of all, through just regular code enforcement action. Um, we do have regulations about nuisances. We define nuisances in certain ways. Barking dogs, for example, we, we deal with that all over the community and we have ways to measure that and to determine when it's a problem and when it's not. Um, and also there could be civil action brought against somebody if, if a neighbor feels like they're being adversely impacted by the use. Um, not not easy routes to pursue, but yes, there are some protections that would be in place here, certainly for neighbors. Um, we're not talking about a situation, for example, where uh, we've had some discussion about ag protection areas that can that can protect occasionally the agricultural operations. I don't think it means the minimum was, acreage, correct? Mm -hmm. Not even close. And we, yeah, no, it might be like 20 40, acres or something. And, and we would not suggest that that come into play here. So I just mentioned that to say, no, none of those protections from a nuisance claim or the like are being contemplated here. So 
are the concerns are the main concerns because we're putting it in a zone that if they stop being a flower production area, they have some other right, rights to the area that could become a nuisance? Yeah. Okay. That's it. Because to me, I'm like, this is great. What's the big? Like, I want to live next to a flower farm. <laughs> and I think it's kind of cool to change something back to rural residential, but I guess I can see your concerns. Before we go any further, um, this is a public hearing. Is there anybody else that's here to speak on this case? And let's go into public hearing. We were, oh, we weren't in public hearing? No, we had. We I thought I was already in public hearing. hearing. Please come up. <laughs> uh, Scott Barnes and my wife, Maria Barnes, is behind me. We live right there on that little 90 degree turn. The farm's down here. Uh, your concerns about uh, them bringing in 792 tons of chicken manure? Oh. Not going to happen. There used to be a house right here. The Morleys live there. You might know Jed Morley. Mm -hmm. Been family, been around for a while. They had horses back there, and there was horse manure there all the time. Good. Where we lived with the winds blowing, we never smelled anything at all. But the comment I really want to make is, on a positive note is that uh, Yolette Warner, the wife of, of Reed, has got a fantastic green thumb. Their house is an example of what this field is going to look like. They've got flowers and flowers and flowers. And we, in our house, living right next door to them, we have some of their flowers that we have absorbed into our yard to make our house beautiful as well. So my only comment is, is that the green thumb of Yolette Warner and the brown thumb from working on the dirt from Reed will really make this a very beautiful area. And my only regret is, is that the thistles, that little, that real ugly weed that has that purple flower, the flower of, of Scotland, the thistle, will not be growing there anymore. We'll have to go further down the road to find them. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hello, how are you? My name's Nathan Burston. Uh, I live at 1355 East, 1520 South, this house right here, so I share a property line on my north and uh, east side completely. Um, we're the ones that built that house, so we were there the whole time. Uh, that whole area has been a nuisance since we moved in. The, the weeds are uncontrollable. The rodents there get in my yard, they tear it up, the weeds get in my yard. I burned that field down once. If you're aware of that happening in the past, that was me. Um, <laughs> so uh, I try to also I try to also shovel this sidewalk right here during the snow, um, but that can't be done because the sunflowers grow so long and high. The snow comes down, plows them down, then they're covering the sidewalk. That whole place is just a disaster, and I, and it's also a huge safety issue, not only with me burning it down again, but the weeds. <laughs> would grow so high around the corner you couldn't see around the corner and cars would have to inch clear out into 1400 which is a higher speed zone to try to see around the field in the weeds so from my perspective from where I'm at and from what I see and from the dangers I possess to that field uh, this is a very 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 welcomed change I don't care about what he does there with the flowers I don't care about the smells that come off the flowers I don't care if he uses it for commercial production or whatever, the, the changes that he are making are beautifying the area. They're helping the neighbors. They're helping the city. I have no objection whatsoever to anything that he does in that area. I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. So thank you. Great. Thank you both. Anybody else? Okay, I'll close public hearing. Commissioners, any other thoughts or questions? I just wanted to comment, um, well, in addition to the support from the neighbors, which is always fantastic to hear, some of the concerns about possible changes of use. It sounds like there's some safeguards, for example, the height of the grain mill, how many animals can be on the property. So even if it was changed, I feel like there's some safe guardrails that will prevent 
any kind of strife if that happens in the future. In, in addition, there's another safeguard. The landowner has only provided a lease to this particular individual to do this particular thing. So that's a, that is another safeguard. else? Okay, I'll look for a motion. I move that we recommend to the City Council the zone change, of, uh, the City Council approve the zone change for the Warner Flower Farm uh, with, subject to the findings and conditions. Second. The motion is second. So we vote. All in favor? Yes. Yeah. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you all for your comments. Uh, we'll, that will now go to City Council and we'll go on to our next agenda item, which is uh, preliminary plat reapproval. Yes, um, as we previously discussed, the location is just north of Quiet Valley. A couple of years ago, the applicant did come before um, the city, the Planning Commission, and the City Council. Um, for approval. This is a master plan development, so this will require um, city council action. Um, there's no changes. Uh, oh, let's go ahead and advance to the next slide, excuse me. So this is the layout um, that was previously approved. Um, and as it was presented to the development review committee, there were no proposed changes to the um, lot size or count. Um, but if you do look, um, Sorry, I keep jumping ahead. So 53 residential lots, and the zoning is already in place. It's an R115 zone. And so the uh, reason for utilizing the master plan development is to um, address some of the odd corners that the property has, but also provide a variety of lot sizes. Um, if you had the opportunity, opportunity, excuse me, to look at the conditions, number three and four um, were comments that came up um, leading to the DRC meeting and in the DRC meeting. And so if we look um, at the next slide, please. So there's this little tail here. When this first went through, and the applicant is here, and he can probably correct any information that I uh, don't recall exactly, but if we go back one slide, um, there's a large area along the railroad tracks. And the first go round for approval, I think it was undetermined as far as ownership and whether or not that could be utilized as part of the subdivision. And so number three um, is pertaining to that issue. And my understanding is that staff has done some research and there's the potential to include that, um, which would net two additional lots in the subdivision. Um, but in order for that to happen, the additional railroad dedicate, dedication is then made to um, Spanish Fork City. And then the fourth condition, um, which my understanding is still under review, or is it settled? We're a thumbs up on that one. Um, so if we jump to the next slide, please. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a little square in lot six right here in the second phase. It's an existing cell tower that has a lease um, and the right to stay there. And so the first, um, approvals given to the subdivision included that within the lot and then there were specific uh, wall requirements and access requirements. Um, this go around, uh, the applicant did raise the question to the city um, if we'd be interested in having that dedicated to the city so then that would not be the uh, responsibility of the property owner to maintain. Um, the DRC did discuss that over um, hence condition number four. And at this point, the city would be comfortable with having that um, easement area dedicated to the city. Any questions for staff? I have one question. I have one question about uh, the property on that east side. Who owns that, that uh, narrow stretch along the railroad now? The applicant does. So, so the applicant worked with the title company. So that's been done. Resolve that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How, so it would potentially increase what we're seeing now from 53 lots to 55. Yes. By 
by shifting everything over into that space and adding a new lot on the top and bottom? I believe they were the the phase other lots. two. Is that correct? Or have you given thought to where those might be? be? Shifting lot lines around to fit two more lots in without really, without expanding that boundary that you see there, the outside boundary. And those those changes would happen. Why don't you come up to the microphone? Uh, we are, we're ready to go on phase one. We're excited about, about the market conditions improving and being able to go build some homes. Um, so, so phase one, we, we have an approved final plat and we're ready to go and don't want to change that one. So any additional lots would be done from a reconfiguration of phase two, of just shifting lot lines around and until we can, can make extra lots fit based on a little bit of extra acreage in the project. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And you represent who? Fieldstone Homes. Randy Smith with Fieldstone. Still Fieldstone. Yes. Okay. Any other questions I can answer for you? I have a question for Brandon. Change still consistent with an MPD and the R150. Yes. Okay, I know you just went through all this, but I just need to I just need a little bit of reiteration. Why do we have the tab out and then that? Because the, the rest of this area was a question mark. Oh, okay. Um, and so this is the layout that was utilized with the first preliminary. That is the last one. That's an old one. Um, but if we go oh. back a slide. Yeah. That's the one now. So oh, this would oh. show the entire area gotcha. along the road track. Okay. Yeah. Great question. We can't really explain the tab still though, right? I mean, that was just a weird <laughs> aspect of the original yeah. design. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for the applicant? Okay. Um, this is not a public hearing, so any questions or comments from any of the commissioners? Okay. Pretty straightforward. Yep. I'd entertain a motion. I move that the proposed uh, preliminary plat be recommended for approval based on the findings and uh, conditions that are listed here from staff. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. So a vote, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So the motion passes. Thank you, I'll go in front of the city council. Appreciate it. We'll build some houses. Let's yeah. Do it. <laughs> it's been a while. They're gonna sell like that. Dave or Brandon, we have an agenda item for a discussion. What do you have you want to discuss? No, we're here at your disposal. Uh, I don't have any topics one. <laughs> um, I did want to bring up, me and John talked uh, last uh, planning zone meeting about maybe doing a field trip in the next month. Lagoon? Mm, well, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. You can go but previous possibly. if you want to. Um, but maybe that can be like a, a, a side trip. To, to go check out, uh, I mean, John, do you want to explain what you want to look at? I mean, you want to go check out some of the other parking uh, that yeah. other cities are doing, uh, areas that they're doing well, and other areas that might be a concern. We did that some time ago and looked at just one or two other places. There seems to be more and more pressure for us to look at our parking ordinance again. And as we get higher density, it's definitely going to be an issue. And it's one that is going to come up every time unless we come down hard on something and say, you know what, if you want to build in, in Spanish Fork, this is our parking issue. And I think it's a good way to go because a developer that comes in needs to know what his costs will be. Every time that we say we're going to hold to 2.5 or something like that, then they complain, well, we're losing the building areas, which is true. But that's no different than all of the other things that we ask for. And every time that we have someone new come in, they say, oh, but there's these studies, there's these studies, there's these studies. 
we even actually had a, a, a very good discussion with uh, the group from BYU who came and looked at our ordinance and looked at all the other different areas and it came down to, well, you guys are pretty good. You know, 2.5 is about right for our, our city, at least that's how it came out. And when we talked about, uh, you know, well, maybe we could reduce that for studio apartments or for one bedroom apartments and stuff, and stuff like that, I think we need to really decide if that's something that we are going to stick hard to or if we are going to go back and revisit that because if some of those projects that we've already been contacted about in the last year or year and a half come back, they're going to come back with the same ask. We had it just last uh, last month or us two months ago, this high, the city council last month on the development on South Main Street that they wanted less density for parking. And we were talking about that's a possibility if you have certain conditions. And I would like to have staff or someone look at these places where there is less parking. And I don't think that it's fair to take us close to a university, you know, where there's a lack of vehicles. Uh, we do have an area that we may want to look at as things progress with Center Street and what may go on there. But in general, in the other places where uh, mass tra transit isn't available and stuff like that, let's find out what's going on. You know, let's, let's see if we, if we can come up with some alternatives that may make sense uh, and maybe relook at some of the things that are being done. I've been, to, I've been through uh, multiple cities looking at different places, and some of the things that we don't allow in Spanish Fork don't look so bad after a few years, after uh, trees and other landscape grows up around it and stuff like that. I'm talking about uh, uh, parking underneath uh, uh, the, covered parking. the covered parking, just the covered parking rather than garages. There's, there's issues with that and I think there's issues with it being in front of the buildings, but it'd be good to go take a look at it and discuss why it is or isn't desirable and whether that's something that Spanish Fork needs to adopt or is it, or are we good? There's one of those and right if we're in good, Springville. Let's, yeah. stop, let's stop dancing around the issue and come down hard on, okay, this is it. And I think it'd be helpful for those developers that are gonna, that are gonna come knocking at the door again. There's a good example of that actually right in Springville south of 4th South, like toward, I think that it would be worth it to look at because I'm, I mean, I'm personally- That's one of the places. A, I'm personally in favor of, if it's behind the buildings, not face, not on the road, I think those those covered parking spots are good and it keeps people from turning a enclosed parking area into a storage space when it's hard to, it's hard to enforce, but- It counts as parking, that's really storage. Right. So I think some good examples, maybe a positive and negative, that we could find in cities that have had, you know, different than us, would be nice to see. And then we, we could take that in mind. I mean, not everybody's got the same constraints that Smash Fork has, and we don't want to just go off what our city does, but I think it'd be good for some of the commissioners to get visuals of where it's worked and where it hasn't. And, and I think podium parking is something else that we may want to be aware of. I don't know that it's necessary, but it's been proposed now once. And it, is, it has been brought up a couple of other times on smaller scale. And that may be something that somebody's willing to do if the space is limited, you know. Uh, so I don't know how, I don't know how we get more information if we don't go take a look at some of those things. And I'd be willing, you know, I'd, I hope that the other commissioners would be willing to take a little time sometime in the late afternoon, afternoon, early evening to to do that. I think July, we were talking, we thought, me and John personally thought July is too busy for that, but maybe in, as we think start to, we're not as in the fiesta days mode in Spanish Fork. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, that in that the might coming be a months, great time to get out of Spanish Fork. <laughs> no, it's a great time to be in Spanish for it. I agree, and I do, I do agree also that it's time to really send a recommendation to the city council about park, it, parking adjustments if we're going to make some. And 
so, something we've talked about before is adjusting the parking for townhomes and and for higher density in different ways. Would that be something staff could set up for us? Of course, right? So I think, and I think, uh, I think along those same lines, if any of us can can think of a place in Spanish Fork where we've got a high density situation without a parking problem, show us it. Yeah. Because we, we talk about it all the time of, of what are we gonna do, how many spaces are in the driveway, what can we, you know, visitors, parking and everything else. I have yet to see the, the development in Spanish Fork that we don't have a problem with on-street parking. And it may be a thing of volunteer parking. It might be that someone might say, man, if I have to park inside of my development, I'm three blocks away, and I'd just assume block, I'd just assume park on the street and walk around a fence to get to my apartment or to my town home. And if that's true, if people are parking on the street and there are open parking spaces in the parking lot, then we need to think of ways that we can resolve that issue to get parking off of the street. Well, I, I think we see that on that fourth yeah. north. They, yeah. They, they yeah, on, on the east apartments. When there's places open behind, but right. that's allowed. But well, and the question is, is if it's a well-designed development, on-street parking actually is not a bad thing, except for snow removal. Because there's a lot of really great, good examples of good on-street parking, but we've got our snow removal issues. So then we have to have over, you know, make sure that they can move into parking if it's a high-density place. And I, maybe we just need some education, Dave. Maybe we need some education about good and bad practices. I don't know. Well, I think I don't think there's anything wrong with what we've been discussing up to this point. No, I, I like the direction we've gone. Gone. I like that we've stood to that that model we've had. I think, I mean, the developers are always going to push for less because it's 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 money and it's revenue, but that doesn't mean it's what is right for Spanish Fork. And uh, I don't know. One thing I'd also add is. If a developer has that same table in it in their presentation, just tell them to take that table out before they present parking to us. And you say that because in John used the phrase hard line. I wouldn't quite put it that way, but the city has a standard. Yeah. And that hasn't been changed, and that's where we're at, and that doesn't stop somebody from asking us to change it, and that's what happens every time we see a project you know we get that it's we've had the same you know so to speak kind of approach made many times at staff level by way of people uh, providing their justification for there being less parking and the answer has been the same for years right this is what it is I really appreciate um, everything about what you guys clearly are thinking about and what's been said tonight uh, a couple of immediate thoughts um, first of all, in terms of identifying a parking problem, which is that you have uh, a need for more vehicles than spaces to accommodate them, that's hard to do during daylight hours, you know, even during the summer. That, mm -hmm. that happens generally later in the evening uh, at times like that. So I don't know how much necessarily we can gleam from getting out and about in the community on that particular issue, on many other things that you've brought up. You're reminding me of what we did back in 2014, 15, 16, when the R4 zone concept was discussed and we went with the planning commission then over the period of many different weeks on a lot of different trips around to look at a lot of different things. And I absolutely think that uh, the commission at the time really appreciated that. They came a long way in terms of what they felt was important and was a must have, for example, while also maybe letting go of some of the other concerns that they, they had. Uh, totally in favor of everything you're talking about. Of course, I get to drive, <laughs> that understood. 
Um, Can we my fix that? The only question, I guess, is when and how much time are you guys willing to give? It, it's hard to make a series of two hour trips out. We get four hours, maybe a little more than that. You know, we could do a lot more. Uh, in the past, we've done that evening hours, and for the next couple of months, that works fine. We've done like an early Saturday kind of a thing, which sometimes also. I think in the evening would be better of a weekday. That, that'd be that'd be your more. Yeah, it's a matter the, of whatever. The residents goes. are there, and that's. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it might not be easier for our schedules, maybe so much, but that's when you're going to see the truest example of what you're what you'd want to be looking at day in day out. Just tell us when, but truthfully, uh, I think it would be more meaningful for everybody if we got more than a couple of hours at mm -hmm. once. I think so. The last thing by way of the timing, uh, we're right back at it. There is a group that will present in your August meeting a concept that they have, and a uh, very seasoned group, you know, tens of thousands of multifamily units across the country, and uh, I don't doubt what they say, and you know, they certainly believe that uh, they don't, I, I believe them by way of their conviction of feeling like 2.5 parking spaces is too many for what they have. Um, so they will give you the full court press in August on that and some other things about our design requirements. So I look forward to the conversation, <clears throat> well, excuse me, at least in part as a way to to talk about some of those things that are really hot buttons for developers that they don't want to do, that we have to compel them to do. Frankly, some of them I feel really strongly about. It's just me. But um, again, love to do it. I don't know how you want to go about finding a time, but if you want to look at calendars now, we could do that or just whatever. Before we decide on a time, I want to ask you about one thing. And that is, is that in several other cities, and a couple of them just south of us, are that there are developments that have incorporated uh, RV parking and other parking that is locked or whatever. Sometimes it's just graveled rather than paved. And by the way, in Springville, that one has a place too. And you know, that's an amenity and I know it costs some money and I know that, you know, it's gonna be part of your HOA or whatever, but I don't know of any of those in Spanish Fork. You know, and when we start talking about people that have done things all over the country and everything else, they haven't done it in Spanish Fork or else they'd know what we are asking. And along the Wasatch Front, I don't think we're that different, uh, with the exception of where there are uh, where there are colleges, as simple as that. You know, people who can't afford to be permanent residences, residents, residents don't have uh, access to a vehicle at times. So it's more of a it's more of a cultural thing than it is what they would like to have. And I happen to be one of those people now that have uh, one more vehicle than I can drive. And there's a lot of families that have an extra vehicle. And we are kind of numb to that fact, and we say, "Oh, well, if it's in a if it's in a multi-unit dwelling, you know, somehow they don't they're not going to have those things, you know." And to say they're not going to have toys and they're not going to have the trailers with the wave runners on them right now and stuff like that is just ignoring our population. And uh, you know, so we need to take a look at, at some of those yeah, we can possibilities. Yeah. And I don't say that it's all it has to be that way. But we're always looking at the smaller chunks, and we're always looking at, like for instance, if you've got a one bedroom apartment, the chances that you're gonna have more than two vehicles are a lot less, and maybe you can drop that. Maybe you can drop it from two, two and a half if there's only one bedroom. But one bedroom doesn't mean there's only gonna be one vehicle. That's for dang sure. You know, so anyway, yep. uh, I think the only way that we can do that is to look at the places like what we were talking about, to look at the place and say, okay, who's doing it right? And what isn't good? I'd kind of like to just take it a ride, and I guess I probably will in the next day or two now, at the project that's going over that uh, Chris Childs started. 
you know, with the four stories, uh, you know, that's, that's coming along pretty well. And uh, we have those parking issues. And if you remember, he's got some uh, standalone parking and some parking underneath the, the buildings. And uh, he's got the businesses that are going to have some shared parking. I thought that that was, you know, a unique way to come about it. And I think that he, he finally came, I think that those comply with two and a half, don't they? They do. It took, so I gotta tell do. you, that so, was a, it was a challenge getting those folks there. Yeah. And the shared parking that, is what. See, so that may be one of the good things to look at. Yeah. I was, I was the applicant on those. But ones. that was tough. Were you? Yeah, I came cool. for all of you all and we barely made it. <laughs> well, it's working. It's working, well, at least from it, what I can see. Is it? <laughs> None of well, them nobody's right there yet. Yeah, none of them are occupied. John said it's working. We'll see. Well, that's but, fine. Right? <laughs> but the interesting thing is, is that, is that with those restrictions, they build them. That's what I'm, that's what I'm getting yeah. at. You know, they're there, they're, they're built, or they are being built, and they will be occupied in the next few months, some of them. Soon. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Let's not uh, think that we're always at the end of the rope here. Let's find a comfortable place. Well, no, that, that's a good example because that, that fits in. It's got a high density. It fits into our parking requirements, fits in all of our requirements. And it's it's going to be a very profitable project for that developer. And it looks point. good. Uh, okay. It looks good. It complies. And others might just want to be cutting some corners. And uh, there's no reason for that. If, if everything's followed the way we need it to be followed, we can hopefully be a win-win situation for everybody. I think we should look at it. So we do have a few issues we're talking about, <laughs> do we? And one of them has, yeah. So let me reiterate. Are you changing the RV issues? parking. Oh. No, I mean, a few things, like the RV parking, mm -hmm. because we know that the biggest problem with, well, there's two problems with Somerset. I think you're only going to see RV parking, though, where they have the places I'm thinking of that, John, is they have the odd shape lot. Yeah, it's kind of taken up a weird pie shape. Yes, in those because it's they do charge that as a revenue for them, but it's not worth the expense they put into it. Yeah, right. Well, the hard part is like if you're looking at the one of our biggest parking problems is Somerset Village, right? Yes. They all the RVs and the buses and the boats and all that that they're all parked on Canyon Road, and then there's the going and visiting people there, finding their little parking spaces and walking home. It's almost and impossible. Are they visiting? And are they hard to, yeah, get to? And are there any available? Anyway, those are, yeah. But that's a different issue, I think, than higher density. That, townhomes, different versus, issue, yeah. townhomes versus apartments. I think the and if you're ready to list off everything, that would be helpful for me, but everything that you've mentioned, they're completely complementary things that by visiting a lot of the same projects, we can look at a lot of different just elements of how their design, you know, from a layout perspective, including, you know, with their vertical construction and that type of a thing, so. It's, we have a couple of minutes of time. For me, I think it would be before, after our next planning meeting and between the August and September commission meetings is when I would propose. You guys aren't trying to squeeze vacations in before kids go back to school. Uh, Let's send that. an email That's out with some yeah. 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 Um, in fact, if you don't mind when you have a moment, uh, just shoot us a note with, with times out? and dates. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, incidentally, just for me, they're good because they're already blocked out. To some degree for your meeting and city council meeting so um oh, tuesdays and mondays are not good for you are good tuesdays are and mondays okay. are oh those not meetings. right okay um but uh like i said as well we've had good luck even <clears throat> with weekends if anybody's willing to to do that brandon gets excited when i talk to him about saturday stuff <laughs> so yeah i'm saying i don't like that going on a Saturday. Okay, can I bring up a totally different issue that I would love to go on the, a field trip for? The last thing, can I mention this? If there are specific sites that you want us to look at, email those to us as well, and we'll get those. I am a route wizard, so I will put together the best, most efficient way to visit 
anything you guys want to look at. I want to go to that so, one in South Springville that I brought up so many times. I think I know the one you're talking about, but we could reach out to the city and get the data behind. We it. could the plans, see their actual parking ratio and all of that kind of stuff. So that was it, Sean. Sorry. Okay, my other issue that I really would love to have, far, I mean, this is this is the priority, but I would love to have a presentation from that developer that came to the APA conference last year. Not as a spiel for him to come, his group to come to Spanish Fork as a developer, but I'd love to have him come and give us a presentation, talk to us about funding, talk to us about impact to the community, um, and neighbors and um, for the affordable workhouse workforce housing. What do we call it in Spanish for? There's different terms yeah. for it everywhere, yeah. but you know what I'm talking about. Adam Langford. Yeah. Is the, yeah. And and I would also really love to go on a field trip to his the one he told me about in American Fork because yeah. he said that's more like that's more, a better fit than the one we went to at the APA conference. And there are a handful, incidentally, in American Fork that we might want to hit right. with what we're already talking yeah. about. So. And, it, and to me, I'm not pushing that we have to have this in Spanish Fork, but I do think we need to start having a conversation about looking to see what the options are for Spanish Fork. I think the state legislature is pushing you know, that we have to have it here in Spanish Fork. Right. Me, <laughs> right. That was going to be my comment. We, uh, the four of us in our office met today to talk about our moderate income housing report that we have to have submitted moderate by income. the 1st of August and being able to talk about some things like what you're you're describing there Shauna some new approach to make workforce housing more you affordable housing with you and tell them to stay in their lane federalism and all that local government does a better job I, could, I, mean, I do it all the time and it gets us nowhere <laughs> <laughs> and here, here's the here's the response that a lot of us in local government don't appreciate or agree with, but because we are subdivisions of the state, that is cities as entities in the legislature's oh. view, we are. Did you choke? We are. Oh, oh. I hear it all oh. the time. All the time. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, just I'm part sure. of the, the I'm life. cursed. I can play both sides. It's a curse. You, you could, but I. Uh, Top-down control is not going away when it comes to land use. It's moving in the other direction. So so maybe let's be proactive about some good quality. It can't hurt. I completely think that's and the approach that you should that take. Yeah. Land is already developed. <laughs> well, there's a lot of ideas when it's not your money. Should I make a motion? Um, I had one more topic. Last uh, Planning Zoning Commission, we had some comments made about people not knowing about the uh, tracks line going out th their land. Um, th that's, everybody in that area has been either notified or knows what's going on out there, right? Yeah, I think I shared some correspondence with you guys by way of uh, public comment period. Mm -hmm. I actually think they're two separate projects um, uh, that relate to the question that was raised in the last meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, people get notified in a variety of different ways when projects of all different types are contemplated from the start of something just being an idea to the end of the process, which is some kind of record of decision that says things can be funded and built. Um, certainly an area that I think was being referenced uh, word is out and it's great to have uh, a forum and an opportunity whereby people can get engaged and provide input please and I mean this for you as planning commissioners please get informed about UTA's environmental assessment that they're doing on the prospect of having commuter rail come south from Provo with stops in Springville, Spanish Fork and Payson um, it doesn't take long to go to the website and provide your input. I think you could provide it as a business person, resident, planning commissioner, uh, you know, whatever, all of the above. Um, uh, 
uh, if there are particular issues that you think are worth noting and studying, please do it uh, both with that project and the environmental assessment that UDOT is conducting on the prospect of having a center street interchange. I was trying, I watched the video of that today and I was trying to figure out, I just want a link to click on to give my feedback and it took me to a website that I, I'd watched the video of that meet the on the, the Zoom meeting, but then I was like, I don't know where the button is to push to give my input. So I haven't been there yet, but boy, you sent us the link to the discouraging. website. Okay. I mean, maybe well, it may not be discouraging because all of you could maybe find it better than me, but so. But Dave, with that, my comment being that all the city sends out that is duly noticed. Everybody knows about that. Something that you dot might be planning, have in the works. The, especially the video that was the, the slide that was shown that meeting, that was a that was from UDOT and not from the city. So the comments that the city was putting a bus stop or something like that or a train stop on somebody's land without notifying somebody that was way off base. That wasn't from the city. That was from another state entity. It was, yeah. yeah. It, um, maybe I'm remembering the comment a little bit differently, but. This is the United States, right? I mean, things don't happen without property right. owners being engaged and informed and, and everything like that. So for me, it's a given that there is that involvement, there is that engagement. And frankly, there are times when uh, properties are needed and when that's the case, if sellers aren't willing, just compensation is provided and uh, that's how a society functions in my right. opinion. But, but that's rare. It's rare for you to, uh, it's much, much, much rare, more rare even for Spanish Fork City. Right. That's right. I mean, on our level, but that's, that's what I'm concerned about is yeah. making sure that we're exactly yeah doing the best we can on all that stuff. Yep. Any other points we have for the staff? Just briefly, I wanted to put the uh, Utah League of Cities and Towns annual conference on my fellow commissioner's radar, September 6th through 8th. I've been talking to the league a lot because there's a big gap between all the training that's available for city council members, mayors, and then there's a huge gap for planning commissioners. And so they're gonna be doing some breakouts in particular for planning commissioners, um, but also they have housing, transportation, um, coding, all the all the issues that we deal with, there'll be breakout sessions, and it's a fantastic conference. September Is that, six through eight. Yep. Is this different than, um, than the is this different than the other one I went to? That's it, the APA it, conference? Yeah. This yep, is the right Utah there. League of Cities and Towns. September 6th through 8th? Yep. And you, you don't have Michelle, to attend every day, all day, but you can take a look at the agenda and the breakouts. In the past, they've had a day that's been dedicated to land use stuff. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, I bet that's probably still the case. So if you could make one day, my guess is, is that's going to be Thursday um, available to attend. Uh, I appreciate you mentioning that. That's getting close. It is getting close. Um, we'll dig up more detail and get that sent out. Uh, we always ask that if you want us to register, you please help us do that before like the the late fee deadline, that kind of a thing. But I've been up there a couple yeah. of times, but not as a planning commissioner. Through, you were once through other ways. commissioner. I have been up Richard. Well, uh, yeah, we, I went up with Richard once. Went up with at Mike's. You know, uh, oh, yeah. Mike. Anyway, uh, but I don't know that we've ever been invited as a commission to go. Uh, I've never received, uh, you know, any kind of communication of when it was, or when it is going to be, or an agenda. And if so, some of that, you know, they'd like to have you, they'd like to have you uh, pre-registered to go up. You have so, to. Yeah, so well. I'm, I, I'm saying if the commissioners are going to be invited, you know, let us know and, and so we can get back to you and let, let you know if we'd like to attend and what sessions or what days. You're invited. Thank I'll you. I'll give you the details <laughs> and uh, there's another training October APA September it's also September so towards the end of September right in Ogden, in Ogden which is uh, totally focused on land use stuff is uh, that the one I went to more time yeah okay. it was in Lehigh is that where it was Shauna you went 
Yes, at the movie theater. Yeah. Um, we'll get you information on that as well. And uh, if anything else like that comes up, we'll do the same thing. We have a training budget for the Planning Commission. So all I wanted me to ask if COE is available for those? some, probably not the League of Cities and Towns. The League for sure. I, I think it is. You think it is? Well, you know the old saying, two birds, one stone. Oh, absolutely. Certainly easier to justify the time, <laughs> right? Especially if the city. Now, Michelle, thanks. That is coming up. Where's the? We're halfway done with the year. Right? Mm -hmm. Wow. We're going on a new record here. Anything else? Chairman, I really appreciate the discussion. I was I was worried sick that we were gonna shortchange Mr. Dilly on his last night here, <laughs> and Ms. Martin on her first night here with a meeting that. It's going to take less than an hour, so don't get, don't really get appreciate the discussion. <laughs> this is a this is a short meeting for us. Shortest. I is my shortest meeting. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman, any motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Oh, second. I have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We stand adjourned. Okay, now I have a list of questions for you.